Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Monday, November 18th, 2024, and today we are going to talk insects on windshields, reviving a dead field, and a messy Monday starring carrots. So let's do it. So uh, this weekend, I was in Evansville, Indiana for an event put on by a group called Push It, which stands for Promoting Urban Soil Health in Towns. The event was a farm vitality workshop, and it was a lot of fun. I did a three-ish hour talk about living soil and what it looks like in practice, and then answered questions about marketing with a nice panel of folks for a couple of hours, and I really enjoyed that. The people were great. The call, the panel was great. It was a lot of fun, and I got into a lot of interesting conversations as I always do at conferences, but one I got into with someone from Colorado, I thought about a lot on my three-ish hour drive home. It was about bugs. This person had recently moved to Indiana from Colorado and they were talking about the number of bugs in Indiana and how different that is from Colorado. For those of you who are not from the United States, Colorado is in a very dry region and Indiana is in a pretty wet region. They're like right next to here to us here in Kentucky. And according to this person, there are just not a lot of bugs in Colorado, which is honestly a consensus I've heard from many people over the years. But as I was driving home, I was thinking about this and I had this memory of my father when I was quite young having to stop in a gas station outside of Colorado Springs to wipe the bugs off of our windshield because he couldn't see enough to drive. In fact, I remember this a lot as a kid, not just in Colorado, where I spent the first decade of my life, but all across the U.S. We would frequently drive across the country to see my grandparents in one state and my other grandparents in another state, and I remember a lot more bugs on the windshields back then. And in fact, there is a name for this specific recollection. It's called the windshield phenomenon. Uh, people my age and older remember a time when there were simply more bugs on windshields, so much so that it could become a problem when you were driving. I remember it quite vividly, stopping at gas stations and helping my mom to squeegee off the bugs from the windshield and the bugs from the headlights. The bumper was always super buggy by the time the trip was over, and I remember being careful not to rub against it, lest I wanted a giant bug smear on my pants. However, the trouble with memory is that it's not reliable. Is it really that common? Or am I just remembering one time spread out over my childhood because it fits a narrative that I believe? Well, luckily, you know what is more reliable than memory? The many pieces of research to back this idea up that indeed there used to be more bugs on windshields and just in general. One study from Denmark examined nearly 1,400 surveys of bugs on car windshields and compared insect declines from 1997 to, two, to 2017, so that's 20 years, and found, quote, the abundance of flying insects in a farmland area in Denmark is revealed by numbers killed on the windscreen of a car decreased by more than 80%, end quote. Uh, this study found those numbers of bugs on windscreens, which is what we call windshields here in the U.S., matched those found in sweep nets, sticky traps, and the feeding rates of barn swallows through that same period, which is kind of a cool set of tools for comparison. There are plenty of studies in the U.S. that show not just flying insect declines, some of which go as high as uh, 75 percent decline over the last 20 years but just declines in general of insects some populations mainly pest populations are increasing but by and large species diversity and richness is in severe catastrophic decline this is for a number of reasons broad spectrum pesticide use on farms is a big one uh, lack of biodiversity in crop species and vegetation as both food and habitat is another reason I'm also sure killing a bunch of insects with our vehicles didn't help, but there is at least one study that says cars today are actually worse for bugs than old cars, so someone please bring back the Ford Escort. We had one of those. And as for Colorado, there was a recent massive study that sampled a protected sort of subalpine meadow there from 1986 to 2020. Indeed, multiple generations of scientists have been involved in this particular study, which makes it very cool and found, quote, during the study period, summers became warmer while winters became drier. Insect biomass declined by around 47% and abundance declined by around 61.5% over the last 35 years. 
Insect declines occurred in concert with changes in climate, as some climate factors were correlated with insect abundance and biomass, end quote. So basically, between climate, habitat destruction, and everything else, it's not looking great for insects. This is significant, of course, not just for nostalgia for wiping insects off of windshields, which I'm sure no one really has, but rather for how incredibly sad and ultimately catastrophic this all is. Insects are vital to our food systems, both in terms of pollination, but also balancing out pest populations. Insects don't just consume pests and pest larvae, but they also help feed fly-catching birds that catch things like mosquitoes, which can transfer diseases to humans. Uh, in my mind, one cannot concern themselves with human health and not also concern themselves with ecological health, that is, with bug health, bird health, and all the rest. These things are not independent of one another. So anyway, uh, I hope that was a cheery enough start for your Monday. Would love to hear if this memory does or doesn't ring true for you. In the next segment, Let's talk about reviving abused land, BRB. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. When you need proven varieties you can count on and detailed guidance from seeding to harvest, consider Johnny's your trusted growing partner. Their same-day shipping can help keep your planting schedules on track when the unexpected happens. They're here to help you grow good food. Turning to Johnny's means you can plant high-quality, trial-proven varieties with confidence and know that their expert staff is ready to help with first-hand knowledge because they've grown them themselves. Learn more at johnnyseeds.com. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast and think that bug thing was cool and a bit depressing, well... You can support it at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere the questions come from, but I will always get to those Patreon questions. Today's question comes from Patreon member Megan List, who writes, quote, I am delighted by your shift to daily shows and appreciate that you make the show available on multiple platforms. Thanks, Megan. They continue, adulations completed. I have a field that is mostly dead. It suffered through decades of local farmers dumping chemicals into it. I'm planning on restoring a few hundred square feet to grow and sell peppers next summer. More space to be restored in the coming years. My question is this. How would you restore compact and mostly dead soil for use as a no-till garden? I am planning to break up the soil with a shovel until I get a broad fork and introduce compost and mulch. Interested in any other ideas, opinions, end quote. All right, great question, Megan. And I think it's safe to assume that by local farmers dumping chemicals into it, you mean by conventional farming and not by literally using it as a dump site, that the latter would require a whole other conversation about remediation and possibly a chat with the EPA because yikes. Now, depending on how long ago this took place and what was spread on these fields, it could have an impact on what I'm about to say. If they were spraying any persistent herbicides for broadleaf weed control and hay production in the last three years, for an example, you may have to approach this a little differently. If they were just growing corn and using some Roundup and some 10-10-10 fertilizer or whatever, then you can get back up and running without worrying as much about residual effects from those herbicides, pesticides, fertilizers. I'm going to assume they were producing a commodity crop like corn and soybeans, uh, and the soil organic matter is simply depleted. Either way, my approach would probably look like this. First, I would start with a soil test, probably through Kinsey Ag or Logan Labs or someone nearby who does Albrecht method soil testing to get a good idea of what I'm working with. I like those tests most when starting a garden. Later on, I prefer the biological test, but I like those Albrecht method soil tests, more commonly referred to as base cation saturation ratio tests or BCSR tests to start because there may be significant deficiencies in a depleted field that need to be addressed and these help find nutritional imbalances. Anyway, again, more on soil testing another day. For now, my next step would be to go to consult with that laboratory uh, to see what they recommend for, for amendment additions. Then I'm going to apply whatever they recommend and add some good compost as well, at least an inch thick to the area. After that, to break up that compaction, I would plow slash till the suggested amendments plus the compost into the soil. For you, maybe just shoveling it in, flipping that soil a little bit if you could to just break it up, but if not, getting it deep down in there would probably do the trick pretty well. Are there ways of skipping that tilling slash shoveling part? Yes, but 
like with a house, your foundation is everything and it sounds like the foundation is currently in disrepair and needs a lot of fixing. I think this is one big thing I took from talking to landscapers over the years. Foundation is everything to long-term success. You really need to do that initial work so you're not dealing with issues forever. Uh, so for you, I might lay all that uh, amendments down, the compost down, and then work it in with a shovel. Then if time, I would cover crop over that over the winter and then start that garden area in earnest in June for your peppers. Or you could simply apply a mulch and have it be ready um, at that same time too. Either one is fine. I like the cover crops because it can uh, give you some indication as to what to expect while also getting some good biology working in the soil. But the mulch will do some of the work as well while also suppressing the weed populations. This will all depend a bit on where you're located as well. If you want to plant peppers early, a mulch will make more sense than a cover crop because a cover crop really needs to grow until mid-May here in zone 6B, but it could be later as you get into you know colder and colder climates. A compost mulch, dark as it will be, uh, would be ready sooner to plant into than like a straw or hay mulch, obviously. Anyway, I hope that was helpful, Megan. Otherwise, we're going to take one more quick break and then get messy. Be right back. Today's episode of Growers Daily is brought to you by Farmhand. I don't know about you, but I got into farming to be in the field growing food for my community, not creating elaborate pack lists, not writing newsletters or responding to emails, not designing and maintaining web stores and etc. And I especially don't enjoy doing those things after an already full and fulfilling day of growing food. Actually, if I spent less time on my phone and behind the computer, that would be great. If only there were a solution for that. Enter Farmhand. Farmhand is the only all-in-one virtual assistant built by and for farmers. With one single platform, Farmhand enables you to offload your administrative tasks, send and manage communications, and sell more to your customers. Farmhand saves growers an average of six hours of administrative load each week. That's six hours so you can get back into the field, spend more time with friends or family, or have a life outside of the farm, which is actually a thing. Think about it, what would you do with an extra six hours a week? Sign up for a free trial with the link in the show notes because now is the best time to dial in those systems for the next growing season. Follow the farmhand link in the show notes to learn more. All right, back to the show. All right, so it is Messy Monday in which we talk about some of my favorite messy failures over the years. Something that came to mind today was years and years of mediocre or straight up failed carrot production. Before we started to mulch with compost, carrots were my white whale. I love carrots and I wanted so badly to be able to consistently produce them without having to spend an entire morning or two hand weeding them every time we planted a bed of carrots. I got okay at growing carrots using stale seed bedding, that is getting a bed ready to plant, getting it wet, and then not planting it, instead waiting for the weed seeds to germinate, and then cultivating those out, and then planting, that's what we call stale seed bedding, so I would do that, that stale seed bedding, and then I would sow the carrots, and then I bought a $700 flame weeder, and I would flame weed the carrots after about five days, And then I would cultivate them, and mostly this worked. But it was a lot of labor, and with the stale seed bedding, that set that planting in those beds back an entire week at least. Then harvesting, of course, you had to dig the carrots up, which just brings up new weed seed and starts the whole process over again for the next crop. So that worked, but it also took a lot of work and created other problems. When I started compost mulching, however, suddenly carrots were one of the easiest things to produce, at least in the spring. As long as they could stay moist, which again, carrots have to stay wet for up to two weeks to germinate, depending on the time of year uh, and temperature, they would, the carrots would grow right there in the compost mulch, weed free, and you could just essentially pop them out without any digging when they were ready. It honestly felt a bit like cheating for carrot production. However, in the summer, this can bite you. I mean, not, not literally, but the compost can actually make germinating carrots very difficult. As I'm sure some of you have learned, a lot of composts are outright hydrophobic, which should mean that they are terrified of water, but actually means that they just shed the water really easily. So just mulching with compost has not solved every carrot issue I've had. My current midsummer carrot procedure looks like this. At least a thin layer of compost is applied. Carrots are sown with the jang seeder, 
The beds are heavily watered and then a tarp is placed over top of the bed with the white side up for five days. On the fifth day in the evening, the tarp is removed and I irrigate heavily again. Then I will continue to irrigate multiple times a day until I see good germination, at which point I can pull back a little bit on the irrigating. Compost gets hot, of course, so it doesn't hurt to occasionally mist the carrots while they're young to ensure they don't get burnt up on that hot black surface. Then I just irrigate uh, as needed throughout their growth until they are ready to harvest. The thinner the layer of compost, the more digging you may have to do at harvest. It's not always possible to just pull them up. And also you can do a broad forking before put applying that thin layer just to help ease the, the tension of the soil to bring the carrots out when you harvest them. I've had lots of messy carrot beds, but carrots became a huge summer crop for us. So we found a way to make it happen with the least amount of labor, i.e. the least amount of hand weeding. I will do plenty of more carrot breakdowns in the future. I love growing carrots and there's just a lot to say about them, like that good carrots can be grown on clay. They just aren't as bullet straight as the sandy ones. Anyway, that's it for Monday. I hear it may finally get cold later this week, which should be interesting. I have a vague recollection of cold. It used to happen here. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music and to the team at No-Till Growers. Biggest thank you ever to our Patreon members at patreon.com slash no-till growers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or if you sign up in the month of November, you get a shout out on the show. So big shout outs today to Phoebe Wellburn. Oh, that's a good novelistic name. Matt B. Mena. Richea Grant. Richea? Richea Grant? Good name. Bumble Rock Farm. Excellent. Michelle Myers. What's up, Michelle? Benedict Pestalozzi. Definitely nailed that one. What's up, Benedict? Alice Coleman. Hi, Alice. Jeffrey Padberg. Jeremy Horvath. I wonder if you're related to... Ethan Horvath, the backup goalkeeper for the U.S. men's national team. Probably. Everybody. Yeah, probably. Jesse Collier with the best first name ever. Robert Elliston and Brian Terrell Jones. These are great names. This is this is giving me kind of... All right, here's the story with this one. In the 1920s, right, we had like uh, all these artists from Paris, right? You have like Hemingway and Fitzgerald and them. And then even up in London, you had uh, what, Virginia Woolf, right? Um, but this crew was trying to make uh, Buffalo, New York a thing. That's it. They were. This was like the artistic crew in Buffalo, New York. And so this novel follows their story and talks about how hard it was to break into the mainstream when you had all this competition from, you know, Fitzgerald and, and Hemingway and stuff. And everybody's like, "Oh, Paris," and they were like, "Buffalo's pretty rad. It gets a little cold, but it's pretty cool." Anyway, close to Canada grow good apples up here and they called that movement bumble rock farm they were the bumble rocks awesome all right thanks for listening we'll see you tomorrow bye